lot of people in the United States thought this was potentially like a warlike measure. He's like October 60, 61. October 61, about 62, I meant 61. And literally, barbed wire, boom, the wall. And since a lot of people had family on both sides of the, of the east-west divide, <coughs> families were split in two, kids would be on one side of the wall, parents on the other side of the wall. Actually, they would even destroy one of the ancient churches, or old, old, older churches in Berlin, for room for the wall. And originally, it was a very crude brick wall, cinder block wall that make a much more solid cement wall. And here it is with the hulk of the Reichstag that was burnt back in 19... 33 and then all fighting in 45 still there today it's totally inside refurbished with the outside still the hulk now you can still see shell holes and every, everything else there's east german guards in front of the brandenburg gate and looking over to the family members on the other side of the wall i mean it split it right in two a few people made breaks for it and escaped but the most part it became these very high profile escape attempts but for the most part, it was very difficult. That's an East German guard making a break for it. As we took off and started running. And soon there would be, in this area here, landmines, guard dogs. There would be towers set up with machine guns. I'll show you another picture with that. And Berlin, basically, West Berlin became a little island then. Literally an island within East Germany. Totally surrounded by wall and barbed wire around there. And... Part of the reason why Berlin is still is just this very weird feeling to it. Now, to many in the West, they saw this as a very offensive action, but it clearly this was a defensive action. You got to build wall, a wall to keep people in. You got real problems. And that's what Khrushchev was really worried. How can we ever build anything if so many people are leaving or want to leave? And but this did lessen tensions. The wall in the long run helped save world, save the, the world from World War III. By ending the brain drain, it ended that tension. That was part of the reason the Vienna Conference was so volatile. That along with the Bay of Pigs. And there would be a couple high-profile confrontations. Checkpoint Charlie, it was codenamed, would be the checkpoint between the American and the Soviet zone. And here is American tanks facing off against Soviet tanks. Great museum, the Checkpoint Charlie Museum today. They still have the checkpoint and the sign still up. <laughs> really a cool place if you ever get a chance to go to Berlin. And in 1962, Kennedy went to Berlin and gave perhaps one of his most famous speeches with the Berlin Wall right behind him. And in it, Kennedy made it clear that we will defend West Germany like we would defend the United States. He was saying that the U.S. did credible defense against communism. We vowed to defend West Germany. Now, during the speech, he said in the beginning and the end of the speech that we Americans, me, consider ourselves citizens of Berlin. So he said it in German. This is it on his own index card. This is it. The end, copy of the index card. And he wrote it out phonetically so he could say it in German, because that's actually a C, but when he said, Ich bin ein Berliner. So they have phonetically, so he said it in the beginning and at the end of the speech. And he worked with it with Willy Brandt, who was the mayor of West Berlin, and eventually the Chancellor of West Germany, you know, to make sure he would say exactly the right thing, so everybody would know what he meant. He said it, everyone applauded. Ich bin ein Berliner. But, even though he did not say this, it was close enough that it became a big joke. Because Berliner is also the name of a jelly donut. And so naturally it came off that Kennedy said he's a jelly donut. He never said that, but that joke is said all the time. And when I was in Berlin, I paid one euro fifty to get a sticker of a jelly donut saying, Ich bin ein Berliner. There's a goodbye. And they're jelly donuts. They're like the kind of the flat things that you get here. It's kind of more of like a round ball. With and actually, they're not very good. I don't like the jelly inside. It's just, but you just get one that's just like the round ball of sugary dough. That's deep fat fried. Ooh, I like that. 
just a big ball of fat and sugar. But why don't you put the sticker on something? I don't want to look at because I have yeah, any. You can't. This is uh, yeah. Uh, this is gonna be worse. But that's my sticker. I also bought uh, this. I also bought a little notepad. See, that is a hundred mark notes from East Germany with Karl Marx on it. That's what we need. Wanna look at it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you wanna look at it? Look at it. I think these guys are nice. Put anything on them. But it's just, that's a hundred mark note pass. Sit around, Zach. All right. So it did ease tensions, but Cuba was still a big issue. The United States was humiliated after Bay of Pigs. And the Kennedy administration would initiate. <laughs> oh, that's. Oh, I almost forgot. In the West Side, they put all. They started doing all kinds of graffiti. It became a big deal. And so, you see, there's a little bit of the wall left. And it's got graffiti all over it. Not on the East Side. And that's one of the guard towers, right next to the Brandenburg Gate. There's now all buildings there. In fact, the Holocaust Museum Memorial is where one, where one of the killing fields for the wall was. Ironic. Well, the Kennedy administration would initiate a secret plan. We didn't find, about, find out about this until 1976, called Operation Mongoose. And Mongoose was a plan to assassinate Castro. And since Kennedy no longer trusted the hierarchy of the CIA after the Bay of Pigs, Operation Mongoose to assassinate Castro was actually run out of the Attorney General's office. The Attorney General was Kennedy's brother, Robert Fitzgerald Kennedy, or RFK. By the way, this is completely illegal, what they're doing. Out of the most important law enforcement agent in the United States, they're running a top secret illegal operation. And they even recruited, this is a picture of them, the mob, organized crime which at the time the Justice Department was investigating to try to put him away. Organized crime was still mad at, Ki at Castro because he kicked out the casinos. By the way, mob, that's not a good, that's not good for assassination. The mob's good at killing other mobsters and maybe innocent people, but not a leader of a state. This shows you how insane this was. They had all types of plans. Anything from he liked to go beach combing and they would they were gonna mine a shell so it picked up and it would explode it. There are plans on uh, putting a substance in his scuba diving gear, he let the scuba dive and snorkel. That, that would make his beard fall out so he'd lose credibility as a gorilla, as a revolutionary. Or put LSD in there and he'd act all crazy in front of the people. They also had plans to put an exploding cigar. And they actually got that cigar into Castro cigars, but the cigar was like three times bigger than a regular cigar. So we kind of figured out something was up. And this is actually pretty funny on Mad in Mad Magazine, which was a relatively new magazine at that time. They have the cover with a exploding cigar. Yeah. What was that to kill Castro. Okay. Yeah. Did you say what RFK? Robert Kennedy. Robert for Cheryl Kennedy. And he was the attorney general. Well, they even got a, a gun and a former mistress of his actually got into his hotel when he was speaking to the UN in 1962. And Castro discovered. And so the thing was, no one in America knew about Mongols. But Castro. Castro knew they're trying to kill him. Castro knew they've already invaded once. Part of the reason why Castro could create such a horrible totalitarian state was the threat of American invasion, or at least the justification for the monstrous state that Cuba's going to become. It's not as monstrous as the Soviet Union, but still, it's, it was pretty bad. Even though I, it's, it's not near as bad now, and I desperately would like to go there. When they ease travel restrictions, I'm gone. I mean, I'm living out that door, I'm gone. Really? Yeah, I'll, I'll walk right out of here. Actually, I will set up the trip as soon as I can because I want to go there with, before it gets out too commercial. Why do you like Cuba? I just think be, I just Cuba would be really cool. Or just it's really a neat place, really interesting to go to. It's like you're going to a time warp. It's still like it's 1959. Well, Elvis and Nixon were not yet friends, but 
Khrushchev also felt very weak. The Soviets were beginning to build missiles, but Khrushchev was trying to not tap down the arms race. Khrushchev did not want to spend all this money on weapons. He felt weak because the Americans had such a big advantage. This is one of the first Soviet ITBMs. He felt really, really, really weak. Castro feels in danger. They both have a problem. Naturally, it makes sense that they would come together. Isn't that a great picture? Khrushchev is very happy to be hugging Castro at that moment. And what we're talking about is both sides wanted deterrence. They wanted to deter an American attack. Both were concerned that they felt weak. Remember, Khrushchev wanted to limit the arms race to save the Soviet Union, which arguably is it's a doomed effort. But, oh, this cartoon shows the issue with deterrence. Both sides can build bombs, and it says, a no account to be used because the enemy might retaliate. So you can't use your ultimate weapon, so what do you use? There's going to be war. I think that's a very clever cartoon. And here, what we're leading to is, in 1962, October, the Cuban Missile Crisis. 1962. Great cartoon. What it is, is Kennedy and Castro both, you know, sort of finger on the button for the H-bomb. Those are H-bombs. And by the way, if one bomb goes, they both go. Make sense? And they're arm wrestling over your little Cold War fights. But what's so clever about this commercial, or this commercial, this cartoon, if Kennedy wins, what does he do? He wins that arm wrestling match. What does he do? Castro pushes her. Khrushchev pushes her. Even if Castro... Or even if Khrushchev doesn't, think about Kennedy, wins. What does his arm hit? The button. So even, even if he wins, he'll do it to himself. It's unwinnable is the point of that cartoon. I really like that cartoon. It's a very clever one. But you're right about Mike Khrushchev, but heck, Kennedy would do it himself. So the point is you can't win this thing. October 14, 1962. 1962. A U-2 spy plane, which, by the way, is on an illegal reconnaissance mission. You know, this is illegal flying over Cuban airspace. Found, and these would eventually be the sites of them, found Soviet missiles. Missile sites being built October 14th. And we're going to begin. So the 14th, so the president will find out on the 15th. Thus will be known as the 13 days. 13 days where the world, well, actually, for six little days, the world knew we were on the edge of nuclear war. These are the pictures of the launch sites they were building them. And then these are long, um, they call the erectors where the missile put on this and they would launch them up for the firing. This is a, that's a rocket. That's a nice, there's a, probably a medium range missile, MRVM. And the thing is, with these missiles here, the medium range one could hit Washington, D.C. in about seven minutes. The intermediate range missiles, missiles this one, and hit virtually every part of the United States within minutes. Now, the U.S. had medium and intermediate range missiles in Italy and, and Turkey. The U.S. also had bombers based there, too. So we had missiles right on their border. The Soviets felt very vulnerable. But the Americans saw this as 90 miles away in our hemisphere. Remember that Monroe Doctrine? That's our hemisphere. But think about the big thing. About it's not just at the time. No American president could allow Soviet missiles 90 miles far shore, from our shore. Why? Because what's going to happen to that president? What's that? You look soft on communism, what will happen in the next election? You've got to get them out. And it's got to be public. Kennedy can't do this in secret now. Kennedy needs to show he's stuck on communism. After the Berlin Wall, he's got to show it. This is going to be a public, a public affair. All of Kennedy's advisors wanted, almost all, wanted war. And when they quick, I'll just tell you really quick what they wanted. Someone, they threw diplomacy out immediately. Don't worry about Romico for this. They wanted no secret negotiations. They thought this would look weak. What if it didn't work? 
No, you're going to have to show Castro up, which, by the way, is going to make it very dangerous. Now, don't forget, Cuba and the Soviets think of this as a very defensive measure. They feel vulnerable. But when this happened, the U.S. thinks it's an offensive measure to attack the U.S. because there'd be no warning time. Seven minutes, that's not, not enough time to do anything. Diplomacy, thrown out. And then they said, we could bomb them. The problem was, it's really hard to hit. It probably wouldn't work and would escalate. So bombing would not work, and neither would choice three. What's choice three? Outright invasion. And those are Marines practicing. Think about bombing or invasion. If that happens, Kennedy made it very clear West Berlin will be taken, and World War III will go. West Berlin's in the middle of East Germany. If we attack Cuba, what about Berlin? And I just said, we'll defend Berlin like we're like it's New York City. This will escalate so fast. Now, Kennedy recorded these conversations, and even though he was completely wrong about the reason the Soviets did it, he thought this was an offensive measure, and it wasn't. Kennedy arguably save the world because almost all of his advisors were pushing this bomb or invade and he opted for option three and they called him weak for this a blockade now blockades are legal it's an act of war so they called it a quarantine and originally it was going to be a 200 mile limit they moved it to a 100, 100 mile limit to stop any soviet ships or any ships going to cuba Obviously, Soviets want to hear about it. And they would check it for all missiles. Now, once you do this, we're on the edge of war. Technically, that's an act of war. And on October 22nd, 1962, Kennedy announced it to the world. He went on television and said this. Nobody outside of a tiny little circle in the US or the Soviet Union or Cuba, to be honest with you, knew anything about this. And so for the next nearly six days, the entire world was on the edge of nuclear war. And everybody knew it. They did all kinds of tests. You know, they tested sirens, they tested uh, evacuation procedures. And then people were told, they told us in schools, every place else, the next time that siren goes on, it's the real thing. Period. And so you talk to anybody who was around, then, that's a scary moment. The military went on high alert. This is on the edge of nuclear war. We have bombers, um, they were circling the Soviet Union just out of their airspace ready to attack at a moment's notice. And we are on the edge of full-scale war. Two days into the blockade, here's a picture of it. The first Soviet ship, and under here are missiles. Are those, I mean, those are boats, and then inside of them are missiles, the other ship. Those are missiles. Right there. These are patrol boats. Where am I at? Why am I going backwards? Okay, so that is a picture of a US destroyer shadowing that first Soviet ship on the 24th as it came right up to the blockade line. In fact, they were just about ready to open fire, and the Soviet ship. It's going full speed and they hit a full stop, right on that line. And little did we know, this is a, the kind of submarine. A, a Russian submarine was actually under the water, submerged, escorting that freighter. And when they picked it up on sonar, the destroyer captain actually almost started dropping depth charges, attacking the submarine. And the submarine, which was out of communication because they're underwater, they thought they were under attack. And they almost fired torpedoes on that day. Now, we didn't find out about this in the mid-1980s, I mean, mid but as it turned out, those torpedoes were nuclear-tipped. They had a 10 kiloton nuclear weapon. If that would have happened, it would have escalated to, well, we wouldn't have to worry about anything anymore. We'd be gone. Let me rephrase that. There wouldn't have been us. 
That's how close it came. The captain was like literally going to give the order and then hesitated and then they didn't. I mean, it was so close. The ship stopped. And then on the 26th, a whole series of just crazy stuff happened that we almost went to war. The U-2 being shot over Cuba was one of the biggies. But there's another one. After the AP exam, along with Stalin's, what happened to Stalin's body, right? I'll tell you that story. And this, I'll tell you these stories. Because it's just a crazy series of events happened on the 26th. You just won't believe it. And so, the big day we have to get is the, the day of the 27th, Khrushchev had to broadcast it over the radio, but it's called a letter. And in this letter, Khrushchev's letter said, we'll pull the missiles out. But the U.S. has to agree to not do what? That's what we bomb you. Think about we're talking about Cuba. Invade Cuba. So we'll, wait, who announced? Khrushchev sent a letter saying, we'll agree to this. And actually, it's a very interesting letter. You know, he's kind of talking about the U.S. pushed it. He didn't want to admit it, but he implied that Khrushchev did a really stupid thing by ordering these missiles there. It was really dumb. You can see the, you can see the logic to it. But God, it was dumb. It was just so dumb. But then another letter came. And this letter was, it was clearly written by somebody either under duress or who was drunk. And as it turned out, he was drunk. Should make y'all sleep well at night. This story will come back, especially when we watch one of the greatest comedies ever made. It's considered number three all time. Don't be cringe, but we'll watch that. That's the I last thing we watched. Yeah. Huh? I stared at that poster almost every it is, it's great. It's what's the you'll love it. I showed it at the end of the year. It's kind of a great way to finish the year off. Doctor Strange. Oh, the it is such. You guys will really like it. We will cut it. It they didn't realize how close they were to some of these events when they made that movie. It's it's a comedy. You guys will. They're all my classes always like. It's a great way to finish the year. But in it, he also added, "You better get those missiles out of Italy." Japan or Italy and uh, Turkey. Those, they had to, we remember, remember we had those missiles there. Thing was, you know those missiles? They were obsolete. We're going to take them out anyways. But like, are we going to fall into blackmail? I mean, there are a lot, including the vice president and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said, "Let's attack. Let's attack right now. Let's just go." But Kennedy said, actually, it was Secretary, it was UN Secretary said. Let's just agree to the first letter. Well, act like we never got the second one. But the thing is, they sent that. We agree, but you have to respond by noon on the 28th. And everybody thought it's over. All these men who worked at the White House, remember this is 1963, so they're almost all men. They went home. And they were like, should I get my family out of here? I can't, this is all top secret. They're thinking this is our last night. They thought this is our last night on Earth. That's what they were thinking. At 11 o'clock that morning, they got the message. It was that close. The plan was to start bombing at noon. We found out later, which was quite a shock. The Soviets didn't have the missiles ready, but they had over 100 small atomic bombs, just regular bombs, to be dropped from the plane in Cuba. And Castro made it clear, oh yeah, if you guys would have bombed, I would have used it. Wow, that was so close. Well, the, sink, the agreement would eventually be this. We agreed not to invade. The Soviets would remove those missiles. But the Soviets also added something. This was a top secret. We didn't know about this for years. We'd agree we'd remove those missiles in, in Turkey and Italy. We said we'd remove them. Now, we were going to do it anyways, but we didn't want to look like blackmail. And so, with that, the world is safe. Now, everybody's still on edge. I mean, it was that close. When people are hoarding food. I mean, they're convinced it's over. Ottawa, Canada. You figure it's all the Western world. So Ottawa's going to be vulnerable, too, to nuclear attack. A duck hunter was out in the, near the suburbs of Ottawa, had a shotgun, you know, the duck, fired, missed the duck, hit a wire. The wire just happened to be the wire for 
that was connected to the power source for all their sirens. Source shorted it out, and all the sirens all over Ottawa went off, and people thought it was a drill. And they, I mean, can you imagine the panic? I mean, they thought, this is it, this is war. Four people had fatal heart attacks. Oh my God. I know he means like, oh, can you believe that? And remember, I told you about you know, in third grade, they did that test in my class, they didn't tell us. I believe it. I mean, yeah, it was that. It was last year. You know. They didn't tell you it was a test? Yeah, third grade. Did I tell you that story? Yeah, no. Oh, you I didn't that. tell you that one? You in, third? About first grade. in third grade, they did, you know, we, did we would do the test. And we do a uh, duck and cover or go into the fallout shelter. Well, they did a test. We all went out and lined up, and they said, it's, it's, it's war. And we all came in and went to the base where the gym was. And we said, this is the real deal. So you're going to have to stay here for the next two. This is nuclear war. And they didn't tell anybody that it was a drill. And I remember a few of the teachers just left. I mean, they went, I'm going to get my kids or whatever. They, they left. And I remember kids were crying. And this, I mean, it was only about 10 minutes we didn't know. But those were the scariest 10 minutes I've ever had in my life. Oh, I had bad dreams about that for years. I still occasionally do. And that's kind of thing you can't forget. I mean, it's like, this is the real thing. We thought it was over. It was scary. And I was third grade, you know. What are you, third grade? What's that, eight? <sighs> it, I guess it's, it's all over the state. They did it in schools all over the state. We want to be prepared. And, and take it seriously. Isn't that, isn't that just absolutely crazy? Even like if they actually did happen, then nobody would care. They'd be like, oh, it's just another drill. You're exactly right, because then you would never know if it's real or not. I, yeah, that, I'm not kidding. That's still, I get a little, you know, that little tingle in back. Oh, I'm, it's, that was so scary. I really thought I told you about that. I remember just sitting there going, and I, I should I go get my, yeah, my dad, who was a, a teacher at the high school, he, he was going to get us. You know, what, I don't know, he just wanted to be with us, you know, it's cool. Well. They did do a limited test ban pretty after this. So it did alleviate some of the problem. Isn't that a good cartoon? Let's get a lock on this thing. Nuclear war. I like that cartoon. It's one of my favorites. They did do a test ban pretty to finally end those open atmospheric tests. And they finally got a direct communication between the Kremlin and the White House. It's called the hotline. And it's always like, people always think it's like a red phone. It was actually a telegraph one. But it did alleviate some of the tension. Kennedy, in the short run, had a boost of popularity, but in the long run, it started to make him look once again like the communists are winning all over the place. Yeah. Hmm? This one, this one, as a result of the Cuban Missile Crisis, a limited test ban treaty about testing bombs and a hotline came out of this. So the Soviets and the U.S. came up with a couple of agreements. Because they're so scared of the threat of war. I mean, it was that close. What was the closest? 79 was the closest we came, and that was within minutes. I'll tell you about that one. Remind me, I'll tell you about that one. That's another really good story. And also terrifying. Well, Khrushchev in 64 is going to be ousted. And in his place, eventually it's going to be two men, but eventually Leonid Brezhnev. And he was an old Stalinist. And the number of medals they would give each other, give themselves became comical. And he was he's my vision of the Soviet Union. It's that man. Those big eyebrows and that stern face. But what he did was never again will the Soviets be humiliated. And they began to build up weapons. And the arms race grew faster than ever before. And the Soviets are going to commit more and more and more and more and more of their GDP to build weapons, especially missiles and nuclear weapons. They spent and it spent and it spent. Yeah. So did he replace Khrushchev? Yeah. <laughs> Leonid Brezhnev, yeah. They spent and spent and spent. And the numbers are going to be amazing. Look how many strategic, which means weapons designed to hit the Soviet Union or the US, both sides have. Look at the numbers. The Soviets would eventually get past the U.S. But we're talking 
hundreds of times, both sides could have destroyed the world. Completely. I don't mean just like, you know, those post-apocalyptic words of like civilization is wrong. No, I mean nothing left. Hundreds of times over. That should give you the idea of the insanity of the arms race. I mean, they had over 40,000. The U.S. had over 25,000 smaller tactical nuclear weapons. We're here. It's kind of a miracle, isn't it? Well, what did this do to the Soviet economy? Yeah, killed it. The Soviet economy was in shambles by the mid-1970s. They were having to import food from, ironically, the United States. Isn't that weird? Yeah, grain. And they used to, the Ukraine used to be the breadbasket of the world. They destroyed their economy. By 1980, it was shrinking. They had to cut back on everything. They destroyed themselves by doing this. And the Soviet Union would collapse in 1991. And so a lot of people believe it was events that happened in the 80s that would lead to the Soviet Union's collapse. No. They were doomed anyway, so that state could not survive. But this, building these weapons, doomed it after the Cuban Missile Crisis. So, with that, now it didn't mean that, we didn't realize it. It's not like people in the 80s knew the Soviet Union was in that bad of shape. They knew there were problems, but they hid it. How just awful the Soviet Union had become. Khrushchev tried to save it. Their last leader, a guy named Mikhail Gorbachev, would try one more time to do what Khrushchev did, but by then it was too late. While that's going on, the civil rights movement is continuing. Now, before we get to this, write down the Civil Rights Act, Bill of 57. Why I put that on the bottom, I don't know. There was a civil rights bill passed. The first one since Reconstruction. LBJ was able to get it through the Senate. One of the most amazing, uh, le or, uh, uh, amazing feet, congressional feats. But the bill didn't do anything. It implied it would end Jim Crow laws, remember those? But it had no enforcement. So it's important they got a law. But this bill would energize the civil rights movement. We have to act. The civil rights movement has to force the government to action. In fact, don't forget. That's the only way change happens. If you want something to happen in a system like this, and this is all politics, you have to force political change. Or those on top will continue to do what they do because it's comfortable. You have to make them uncomfortable. And that's what the civil rights movement did. It's going to make politicians who claim they want civil rights, like John Kennedy, uncomfortable. Make them act. That's where you get the civil disobedience. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference was Martin Luther King's group. And they had other members, but he's, you know, we just got to, I can't give you too many names. King and others wanted to use civil disobedience. Remember we talked about civil disobedience before. Remember that? Sit-ins. What they would do is young, you know, think about 18 to 22. So relatively young, college age, idealistic, black and white, the young adults would go into these segregated restaurants, sit at the counter, and wait to be served. Now remember, these are Jim Crow. They can't be served, but they would wait there. And they would face harassment. They would be attacked. There's drinks and things pouring on them. And now you know the importance of civil disobedience. You look at this picture, which one is standing up for justice? You know, the people dumping their drink on them or the people sitting there demanding rights. Now, so what the problem is, if he would have turned around or she would have turned around and punched him, then they lose that moral high ground. Which also should show you how hard civil disobedience was. I don't know if I could have done that. Chris maybe I would have been outnumbered, but I would have wanted to turn around and punch him. I'm not lying. I mean, I'm, I'm human. I'm, it would hard, be really hard for me not to do that. But then, well, crush me, you know, you get more progeny. So, yeah, I would have done it just because I'm, you know, get off my yard kind of guy. That's also how you make fun of old men. Get off of my yard. All right, so, oh, this counter is in Woolworths from North Carolina. It's in the Smithsonian Museum of American History now. You know, it's going to take years, but who is just? Another thing they would do is called Freedom Rides. And these, 
gutsy people would take buses, and there are two main groups who did it. The Congress of Racial Equality, which also did the sit-ins, and SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Commission. So CORE and SNCC. And what they would do is they want to ride buses throughout the South to try to get blacks to register to vote. Remember, they could not vote. And they this a couple things. By crossing state lines is interstate commerce. So they're saying this is a federal issue. They don't want to do it within the state, they want to make it federal. And they want to throw, get a court case about those grandfather's clause. And so, SNCC and CORE, and they travel throughout. They rode these buses, and young, young adults, black and white, knowing they are literally risking their lives. And they would be attacked, a few would be killed, Three civil rights workers from the North would be killed uh, right here in a place called Philadelphia, Mississippi. One of the most famous events in history. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah. What were they trying to get rights for? Register people to vote. And the thing, you know, that's that's a major right. And the thing is, they're just, I mean, this is, they're trying to make people do something. It's really easy for people to say, I'm for civil rights, but have patience. Well, no, they run out of patience. Mouse. This, outside of Montgomery, state police, the equivalent of our National Guard, not National Guard, I'm sorry, our, our uh, Highway Patrol, they stopped one of the buses, and while the police were lining up the people to arrest them, their bus was firebombed, and then, they arrested the writers and in the process beat the hell out of them. This is John Lewis, one of the leaders of SNCC. He had his jaw, see how he's kind of holding you know, away his mouth is? His jaw had just been shattered by a knife stick. He is today a congressman from Georgia. Still kind of talks, it's, it's, you can tell it's just it's never really healed right. Here's their mud shots of some of them. And the point is, what did I say? You know, make them uncomfortable, make them act. Well, the thing about civil rights and those other issues, going into 63, it looked like the new frontier was a bill. Kennedy's actually getting really desperate. Civil rights was a problem. Cuba was a problem. Yeah, the Cuba Missile Crisis was a small term, short term victory, but now he looked weak that way. Oh, and because of the agreement he made in Cuba, they were comparing his Cuba agreement to. What's the city equaling to appeasement? It's another Munich. So, once again, forcing them to act. And this is a picture from it. Leaders of SNCC, CORE, the SCLC, and labor unions did something that A. Philip Randolph wanted back in 45. A march on Washington for jobs and freedom. Why it does it? There we go. And this is going to be a march on Washington. Over 100 or over 20,000 people end up going to this. This is September 1963. Kennedy tried everything he could to stop this. Kennedy knew this would hurt him politically. Kennedy kept saying, I'm working on civil rights, even though it's completely ineffective. He actually personally called Martin Luther King, begged him not to do it. We're doing it. You promised to fight for civil rights, you got to fight for it. And so, the important thing about this is all 13 speakers who got up and spoke, some were fantastic speakers. One of the best was Adolf Randolph, which is by then like the god of the civil rights movement. And Walter Ruther gave a great speech ahead of the United Auto Workers. And people mostly remember one small section of Martin Luther King's speech, but all had the same basic idea. And it's a twofold thing that fits in with jobs and freedom. We must end, is what we got to get, legal segregation. We must end this. And that includes the right to vote. We have to have equal rights. And the other thing is, we need to have legal segregation and economic justice. The poverty rate amongst African Americans was incredibly high. And what they push for is to all 
vote in the poverty rate. All, regardless of race. We should do whatever we can to boost them all. They work hard, make sure they have jobs, so they can all become part of this middle class. Not just a few, everybody come up and all be part of the system. So that's what King's speech was about. Then the thing is, King always had a riff he would do. And we go into this riff, that's what he called it. You're kind of the finish up the speech. He was, he was great. Where he talked about the yeah, Ivy Now he did this in a lot of speeches. He couldn't do it after this because it became too famous. But everyone called the speech the Eye of a Dream speech. Now that was just something he did in all of speeches. The meat of it was this. But we finish up talking about what we could be if we ended segregation, if we ended prejudice, if racism that kept one group down was ended and we had economic justice. What the world would be like if everybody was relatively equal. He was a socialist. He was a socialist. A moderate, liberal, he seemed like a democratic socialist, but that's what he was. Well, but unfortunately, everybody only remembers the, the, that last part of the speech. One more thing. J. Edgar Hoover, what was he the head of? Do you remember what Hoover was the head of? Huh? The National Security Act allowed what group to spy on Americans inside the borders? CIA's outside. FBI, he was head of the FBI, a rabid anti-communist. He had already been spying on Martin Luther King, bugging every room he was at, watching him, harassing King for years. King's a communist, only a communist would want equal rights. Well, it'd be year after that that King would become the most important target of the FBI. And they began to harass him and his family and people around him. And in 64, the FBI sent a letter on Hoover's order. Now it's anonymous, but we now know it's from the FBI. And in it, it said, we have been watching you. And if you, well, we know that you're a communist, and we also know that he wasn't a communist, and we also know that you've been having many extramarital affairs and we have the truth. And we're going to get that information out unless you commit suicide. So the FBI tried to get King to commit suicide. Basically, they're, they're extorting him, trying to get him to kill himself. Basically, yeah. It's actually kind of shocking. Now, King, you know, well, first off, you can see why the family of Martin Luther King to this day believes the FBI killed him in 68. Now, it's almost certainly James Earl Ray who did it, but you can see why they thought that. You know what I mean? You can see why. And, yeah, King was out. I'm just not sure. And it's important to understand about people. He's not a saint. He had flaws, especially with the you know, he basically his for life was threatened for the rest from 54 until 68. But yes, he has flaws. Yes, he did some things that we might not like, we consider to be immoral. But he, you can still do great things and not be the perfect person. And I really get annoyed is when they have these people who have done great things and they kind of turn him to a saint that could do no wrong. You ever watch Gandhi? They turned Gandhi into a saint. And Gandhi was actually, you know, great man, but also kind of weird. The things are like, like really just creepy. But you can still be a good person. Yes, we all have flaws. Well, except for me, of course. But you guys do have flaws. But that doesn't mean you can't do great things. I'm actually very serious about that. That I am without flaw. But the rest of it, hey, why not? No. We all have flaws. There's nobody who's perfect. And just because, hey, things happen, you make mistakes, it doesn't mean you still can't do great things. And whatever your concept of great is, that's for you to decide. And then I will judge. So, what a Vietnam! Ah, oh, the fun never ends. South Vietnam was blowing up. Who who are the guys fighting in the South Vietnam? Who are the people in the the Viet Cong look like they're winning. The Viet Cong look like they're winning. Kennedy knows if South Vietnam falls, he's soft on communism, isn't he? Kennedy's going to increase the number of advisors. And this is an American advisor. These are American pilots flying South Vietnamese soldiers in helicopters before we ever committed. So we're actually kind of in combat. 
It went from less than a thousand when he was inaugurated to almost eighteen thousand when he was assassinated. Advisors. Kennedy turned Vietnam into something very important. And the last thing for today, these are the reasons why he did it. I know, I know. And the Tiffany, I have something to give you. Don't let me forget. We know the domino theory, right? So the domino theory for the Truman Doctrine, but also Berlin. And the thing about Berlin was this. We wanted people to believe we will defend Berlin. Nobody will believe us unless we defend our other friends too, myself, Vietnam. Credibility. Also, the civil rights movement and re-election. He won't get re-elected or get a civil rights bill if they throw Vietnam in his face. He's got to look tough on that. Yeah. Berlin, we, we have vowed to defend West Berlin. If we don't defend our friend in South Vietnam, who will believe we'll defend West Berlin? So we got to be credible. In fact, the term they would use was credibility. By the way, what's missing from this list while we committed to Vietnam? What's that? Yeah, there's nothing about Vietnam. South Vietnam had nothing to do with that. We didn't care anything about South Vietnam. This was politics. Or this is Western Europe. Okay, goodbye. Tiffany, I have to give you the key. I got two things to give you. Aren't I a nice person? I have gifts. You know, it's, it's just, you know why I do this? It's because I do this. Now, I kind of made this out, and I just want to do this when you jot this down. And I'm not even getting, I'm thinking about getting that script about this. Because it's your chapter, you should jot down. Because I've been reading. Um, this stuff really interesting we're talking about now. Yeah. It's almost too much though, it's like. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of foreign stuff. Huh? There's a lot of foreign stuff. I know. Give me one sec. It's going to be small, so you're going to probably squint a little bit. That's okay. Sorry, I just say see if we're getting the format of the card and I thought it was. I blame society. Are you okay? Yeah. I don't care who are. You have a class experience? Yeah. It's, I think you'll be okay with it. If there's a problem, just say that blame me and I'll email, okay? Okay. So get this done, and what I think I'm gonna do is because I will, if you get this done by Monday, 
Where are you going? Where are you going to be tomorrow? I'm going to be in Kalispell. There's like a nursing thing up there. Oh, yeah. Are you going to be here on Sunday for the review session? I'm going to tell my mom that we have a review section, but I don't know if I'll be there. I understand completely. Try, you know, I go through a lot of stuff, and it does really help. Okay. But what I think I'm going to do is, if you get this out on Monday, and turn it in, I know you have the key, so I want you to know, but if you get it done, I will give you extra credit, okay? Okay. All right, now you're on All right, let's go. You know, there's an issue to say I was trying to print something. And there, there are 55 questions.
first. Let's see. 